Hello and welcome to our semester two final review. We've reached the end of the year and now it's time to show what we learned all year long. So starting with number one, let's get to it. Number one says perform the operation. So the operation being performed here is subtraction. Because of this minus between our first and second expressions, we're gonna have to distribute this negative one to do, perform our subtraction. So we have 6x cubed minus 3x plus 1. And now all these signs will flip. It'll become negative x squared minus 5x. And then negative 1 times negative 4 gives me plus 4. After that, we can combine our like terms. So I'll get 6x cubed. And then minus x squared. And then negative 3x minus 5x gives me minus 8x. And finally, plus 1 plus 4 gives me plus 5. There are no other like terms to combine, so that's our final answer. Number 2 it says solve for x. So notice that we're dealing with a quadratic equation. I've got an x squared in the expression. So the ways we can solve for x are, are multiple, depending on the expression. We can always solve a quadratic equation, um, or we can always try by factoring first. And the first method we should usually check is greatest common factor. Then, if there's just two terms, we'll try difference of squares. If there are three terms, we can try magic x factoring. And then if factoring does not work, our alternative is to use the quadratic formula. But I'm going to try factoring first because the quadratic formula can get really tedious, of course. So in order to factor, there's one thing you must do first. You have to set the function equal to zero. Well, right now my function is equal to three. And that can't be there. So to set it equal to zero, I'm going to subtract the three from both sides. So we're dealing with six x squared plus x, and then two minus three is minus one. Now that it's set equal to zero, we can go ahead and try factoring. So I'm scanning my three terms, and there's nothing in common that I can factor out. So GCF is out of the picture. Since we've got three terms, we're going to have to do magic x. So there's a couple ways you can do this. Um, different teachers teach it different ways, so do what's comfortable to you. So magic x works like this. We're going to need two numbers that multiply. To these two multiplied together, a and c. 6 times negative 1 is negative 6. So I need two numbers that multiply to negative 6, but then that add up to that middle number, which is 1. So the two numbers that will multiply to negative 6 but add to 1 should be 3 and negative 2. Check me on that. 3 times negative 2 is negative 6. And then 3 minus 2 is 1. So we're good. Now, since there's this number in front, we may not use the shortcut. That means this, just plugging those numbers in, is incorrect. Because if you try factoring it out anyway, you're not even going to get the same. You're not even going to get anywhere near the same thing. Okay, This needs a 6x squared, but... What we just did gave us an x squared, so that's completely incorrect. When you have that number in front, you've got to um, do it the long way. So in, let's do it two ways, okay? The first way says, hey, split that middle term into plus 3x, that's from here, and then minus 2x, that's from here. And now 
Once we've split up that middle term, we can use factoring by grouping. So let's pull out what 6x squared and 3x have in common. Well, together they have a 3 and an x that we can factor out. And then I would be left with 2x plus 1. And now we'll do the same with the second set of terms. Well, if the first terms gave me a 2x plus 1, I know I'm going to have a 2x plus 1 here. So what I must have factored out would have been a negative 1. Next, the guy that's in the parentheses, we'll copy that down. And then the outside numbers get their own parentheses, 3x minus 1. And so you can see now that we factored it into 2x plus 1 times 3x minus 1. You can distribute it out and verify for yourself that that is indeed the same thing as what we began with. But at this point, since we're all factored, we can set each factor equal to 0. So we'll have two answers then. 2x plus 1 equals 0, and 3x minus 1 equals 0. Let's work on the left side first. Solving for x, I get x equals negative 1 half. And now on the right side, solving for x, I get x equals one-third positive. And those are our two solutions to this quadratic equation that we began with. x equals negative one-half and positive one-third. Now, I want to show you a slightly different way still using magic x, but some of you will be more comfortable with this. You just have to be careful because this is considered a trick. Let's start again. 6x squared plus 1x minus 1 equal to 0. So some of you guys are going to see this. You're going to be like, oh yeah, that's the way I normally do it. So let's see. We need two numbers that multiply to negative 6 and that add up to positive 1. Again, that's 3 and negative 2. Now, because of this 6 in the front, since we have a number in the front, no shortcut allowed. But what we can do is divide both of these numbers by that guy in the front. And notice that we can simplify these fractions. On the left, 3 divided by 6 becomes 1 half. And on the right, negative 2 divided by 6 becomes negative one-third. Now, since both of these fractions simplified but did not actually disappear, right? We still have a fraction. We'll add an x to the bottom. We'll add an x to the bottom. And now we can stick these into parentheses by reading these bottom to top. So my first on the left side will become 2x plus 1. And on the right side, it actually says 3x minus 1. I'm reading bottom to top. So that's the key thing to remember. You've got to divide by the number in front. And now you can set each factor equal to 0. And you'll see that we'll get the same answers as we did before, which are negative 1 half and positive 1 third. So whichever way you do this problem, just be careful um, that when you factor it, you could check that it's correct by redistributing to make sure that you did it properly. Let's move on to number three. Number three says graph this polynomial using the zeros of the function. So the zeros are of a function are just a, another way of saying the x-intercepts of a function. And what do we know about x-intercepts? Well, x-intercepts lie on the x-axis. So to find your x-intercepts, we always set y, or basically f of x, equal to 0. That way we know we're not above, right? Or we're not positive on the y-axis, we're not negative. We're just figuring out, hey, what does x equal when we know that the height is 0? or that basically we're on the x-axis. So keep that in mind. 
to find the zeros, we have to set the function equal to zero. Well, to set my function equal to zero, I am going to write it in my next step. And now, since it's already factored, I can find my x-intercepts easily using the zero product property. I know that x plus 1 equals 0, x minus 3 equals 0, and x minus 4 equals 0. So subtracting on both sides, I get x equals negative 1. Adding 3 to both sides, I get x equals 3. And then my last x-intercept is going to be positive 4. So right away, I found my x-intercepts. So let's stick those on a graph. We have x-intercepts at negative 1, a positive 3, and a positive 4. I'm drawing points to show my graph is going through these x-intercepts. Now our next step is to figure out where the graph is above the axis and where it's below the axis. So we always start on the rightmost side. Now the sign out in front of our, of our function, in this case, it's a positive. Right? There's no negative out in front. So that determines the right end behavior. Let me make a note. Sign in front. determines our right end behavior. So since it's a positive value out in the front, that means that to the right, or over here, our graph is going towards positive infinity. It's above the axis. That's how we begin. Now we're going to make our way left, and now we need to take into account the multiplicity of each factor. So Check this out, at x equals 4, so now I'm looking at x equals 4, that's right here. Now I got x equals 4 from this factor, and that factor has a multiplicity of 1. What does that mean? Well, if the exponent of the factor is 1, if it's a, an odd multiplicity, or I'm just going to use the word an odd power, then our sign will flip, or basically will cross the axis. So my sign there flips to a negative. Now I have another decision to make. At x equals 3. Well, that's from, I got that from this factor right here, and it also has a multiplicity, multiplicity of 1. Since it's an odd power, we will flip the sign, or basically cross the axis. So that flips this guy. We flipped from positive to negative, and now we flipped it again from negative to positive. We have one more to do. At negative 1, our power is, so I'm looking over here now, where x equal negative 1, that's from here. We have a power of 1 again, and odd power means flip the sign. So that's going to become negative at the end. By the way, if any of these exponents had been even, we would have kept the same sign or basically bounced on the axis. So let's see what that really looks like when we connect it. Well, at the rightmost, the right end behavior is positive, so I'm above the axis. Between 3 and 4, I'm negative or below. So notice how we crossed. And then at 3, we cross again because we're positive. And then at negative 1, we dip below the axis once again. So what do you see here? I see a cross, cross, and cross, which aligns with the odd, odd, odd powers. And that's how we graph our polynomial. Let's go to number 4. 4 says simplify. So we're dealing with the division of two fractions. So rather than divide these fractions, we're going to turn this into multiplication by drop, switch, flip, or basically multiply by the reciprocal. 
So right away, I'm going to set this up as a multiplication problem. That's going to be rewritten as x squared plus 2x minus 3 divided by x squared plus x minus 6. Now I'm going to multiply it by the reciprocal. That means we're going to flip these, the numerator and the denominator, swap. So multiplied by 2x squared minus 4x divided by 6x. Now that we're multiplying, we want to see if anything can cancel. So as of now, nothing is canceling because this is all one unit. Uh, treat it like one unit. This is all one unit. Right? So only factors can cancel pieces that multiply. So in order to cancel some of these factors, we're going to need to factor everything that we can. So starting at the upper left side, I'm going to factor this by magic x. So do it whichever way works for you. But this is what I'm getting. Hmm, I need two numbers that will multiply to negative 3, but that add up to positive 2. So that will be plus 3 and minus 1, I believe. Yep. For my denominator, I'm going to need two numbers that multiply to negative 6, but add up to positive 1. So please pause this video and do the work yourself because I'm just putting the factored version. Right? You should try this yourself. Okay, so now I factored the left side by magic x, top and bottom. Of course I didn't show the work. That's where you come in and try to do it yourself and check against my answers. Now I'm going to try and factor anything I can on the right side. So I can't do magic x because this is only two terms, but I can factor out a greatest common factor. So between the 2x squared and the 4x, I can pull out 2x, and I'll be left with x minus 2. Now the denominator is just a monomial, just one term, so we'll leave it as 6x. Now the nice thing about multiplying is once you've factored, really we can just multiply straight across. Like the, everything here is my numerator now, and everything at the bottom is my denominator, and anything on top can cancel with anything on the bottom. But it's got to be one on top, and one on the bottom. You can't cancel, for example, if I have x plus 3 over x plus 1 times x plus 3 over 2. You can't cancel this way, right? So it's got to be something on top with something on the bottom. So let's observe. I've got an x plus 3 canceling with this x plus 3. I've got my x minus 2s. And Right here, I have 2 times x and 6 times x, so those x's can cancel. Well, the 2 and 6 can simplify into 1 over 3. So what I'm left with now, we have to multiply everything in the numerator. I'm left with x minus 1 times 1, which is just x minus 1 on top. And then the denominator, I just have this 3 left over. And so that's our most simplified answer. Let's go to number five. Five says simplify. Well, in this expression, I'm being asked to multiply the first and second factors. So careful, since we have two terms in the beginning, we're going to have to distribute. Okay, we'll do that very carefully. This is not a hard question, it's just, it's just got a lot of um, little pieces you have to pay attention to. So x times 2x squared, that'll give me 2x cubed minus x squared, 
and then plus 2x. That's just from distributing the first term. Now we'll distribute that plus 7. So that'll give me a plus 14x squared. I could write it over here. Or what I'm going to do is I'm going to align it with the like term that it'll combine with eventually. So since we have an x squared term, I'm going to line it up right here with the other x squared term. Next, 7 times negative x is minus 7x. Again, I lined up my x's. And then finally, 7 times 2 is plus 14. That constant doesn't align with anything over here, so it goes off to the edge by itself. And by lining it up this way, I call this the stack method, I can easily see the like terms that need to combine. So these guys will combine, and then these will combine as well. So my final answer is going to be 2x cubed, and then minus x squared plus 14x squared. Keep in mind it's a minus 1. That'll give me plus 13x squared. 2x minus 7x is minus 5x, and then plus 14 has no like terms. And that's our simplified answer. Moving on to number six. So we're given a fractional exponent and asked to simplify the expression. So there's a couple ways we can go about this. I'll show you uh, more than one. The first way we could do this is recognize that we can rewrite this as 16w to the 8th, all being taken to the 4th root. right? Because that numerator would be like my power, which is all to the power of 1, which just means, hey, stay yourself. And then the denominator represents the root. So if I'm taking the fourth root of 16w to the eighth, that means I'm pulling out things in groups of four. Right? This is not the square root where we pull things out in groups of two, but the fourth root. So let's start with the fourth root of 16. Well, 16 breaks down into four times four, and that further breaks down into 2 times 2, and then 2 times 2 again. So if I'm pulling things on groups of 4, the 4th root of 16 is just 2. And you could actually have done that in your head. If you know what number times itself 4 times gives me 16, then you know the answer would have been 2. Now let's do the same thing except with the Ws. So with variables like this, it's really easy to just write it out. So w to the 8th power is w times itself 8 times. And I'm pulling things out in groups of 4. That's one group of 4, which comes out as a w. That's another group of 4, which comes out as another w. So together, we, found we have a w squared. And so our answer here is 2w squared. Another way that we could do this would be like so, just another another method. So that could be seen as the fourth root of oops, the fourth root of sixteen w to the eighth. We can break this into again two pieces because they're being multiplied. So the fourth root of sixteen times um, actually for this method, I'm gonna leave that w to the eighth to the power of 1 fourth. You'll see why. So on the left side, the fourth root of 16 I know is 2. And then over here, see if you remember the rules of exponents. When you have an exponent being taken to another exponent, we multiply them. So the answer is going to be w to the 8 times 1 fourth. Now that looks really messy. So I'm going to simplify that over here on the side. When I have, again, a power to a power, we multiply them. And since I'm multiplying a whole number with a fraction, I'll put this over 1. 8 over 4 is really just 2. So that's my actual simplified exponent.
is 2 times w squared. And I got that by multiplying. So either way, you will get this answer. Let's go to number 7 now. So 7 says use this table of values to graph the function. Here's our function. So we're going to use this table of values, which basically means, hey, plug in x, and then see what you get as your y. So let's begin. f of 0, I'm plugging in 0 first because that's the first value, is equal to 1 fourth to the power of 0. Now anything to the power of 0, you must know this, anything to the power of 0 is 1. So that's my y value when x is 0. Next, let's plug in 1 now. So f of 1 is going to be 1 fourth to the power of 1. Anything to the power of 1, you must know this, is just itself. So when x is 1, y is 1 fourth. Plugging in 2 now. f of 2 equals 1 fourth to the power of 2. So just in case you're not sure where I'm getting this from, all of these are what I'm plugging in for x. So 1 fourth times itself is 1 over 16. So plugging that in here. And then finally, f of 3 is equal to 1 fourth cubed. 1 fourth times itself 3 times is a 1 in the numerator and multiplying straight across. And then 4 times 4 times 4 is 64. Let me write this a little neater. So we got 1 fourth, 1 sixteenth, and then 1 over 64. So now we're going to graph those values. So when x equals 0, let's make this 1, 2, 3. So when x is 0, y is 1. I'm seeing this as a coordinate point. 0, 1, there it is. Now when x is 1, y is 1 fourth. So let me see, if I were to break this up, 1 fourth would be right around here. That's my x-axis, that's my y-axis. My next point is 2 comma 1 16th. 1 16th is smaller than 1 4th. And then my next point is 3 comma 1 over 64. I'm getting closer and closer to 0 actually. So if I were to graph this connecting these points, it looks like that. Now just for fun, just to make, uh, just to prove this, a little further, I'm going to plug in negative 1 for x and see how it behaves over here. So if I plug in negative 1, just to get an extra point, because why not? That's 1 fourth to the power of negative 1. See if you remember how negative exponents work. You're going to take the reciprocal of the fraction. So 1 fourth to the negative 1 is really 4 over 1, which is 4. That means when x is negative 1, my y value is 4. Well, 2, 3, 4. That's way up here. So, yeah, this function is called exponential decay because it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller as we move to the right side, right? Our function, it starts large and it gets closer and closer and closer to 0. So that's our exponential decay function. Now, you could have told me it was exponential decay just by looking at the function itself. How? Well, all you need to look at is the base of the function, which is the thing beneath the exponent. If the base is less than 1, you have a decay. If the base is greater than 1, then you have growth, which looks like this. It gets larger versus decay gets smaller and smaller. So since our base is 1 fourth, 1 fourth is less than 1, therefore we're dealing with decay. On the other hand, if I had something like this, that is a base greater than 1, which should represent growth. And then finally, 
In this case, my base is 3 over 2, which is, careful, it's actually greater than 1, making it growth. Right? 3 over 2 is like 1.5. So you want to be careful. All right, let's move on to number 8. Evaluate cosine of 7 pi over 6. So to, in order to evaluate this, the first thing I want to do is figure out what the heck is this angle I'm working with. So 7 pi over 6 is in radians. The first thing I'm going to do is convert it to degrees. So there are many ways to do this. Um, you can do it however you're comfortable with. But the way I like to do it is I see this as 7 times pi over 6. And since I know that pi over 6 is really 30 degrees, then I'm dealing with 7 times 30, which is 210 degrees. So really, I'm just evaluating. I'll show my work somewhere else, actually. I'm really evaluating cosine of 210 degrees. So next step, I need to figure out where that angle lies. Well, if 180 degrees is over here on the left side, 210 is going to be in quadrant 3. And the distance, this reference angle here, the distance between the 180 and the 210, I can find that out by doing the bigger number minus the smaller to figure out, hey, that's actually a reference angle of 30 degrees. And you can check that that makes sense, right? Because if this is 180, go another 30 degrees, and you're at 210. So next, let's drop the perpendicular to the x-axis. And now we're going to label our sides. So this is a 30-degree angle. Across from 30, we always get 1 half. But since this is going in the negative direction, this is a y value of negative 1 half. If that's 30 degrees, that means this angle here is 60. And across 60 is always radical 3 over 2. But since this is going in the negative x direction, we make sure we label that as negative root 3 over 2. And our r, or the radius, this radius here is always equal to 1. Now that I've labeled x, y, and r, I can, I have to remember, what's my cosine formula? Well, cosine is x over r. So all I got to do is get my x value, which is negative root 3 over 2. And then divide that by r, which is 1. And anything over 1 is just itself. I don't need, even need to worry about the dividing by 1. The answer here is negative root 3 over 2. All right, next problem. Number 9. It says solve for x. So notice that x is in our exponent. In order to solve this, since my bases are different, the only way I can uh, deal with my exponents here is to get my bases the same. Right, so I'm going to have to find a common base first. So look at the bases that we have. We have a 4 on the left and 8 on the right. Both 4 and 8 can be rewritten as powers of 2. Right? 4 is 2 squared and 8 is 2 to the third power. So I'm going to rewrite these bases like this. Everything else is staying the same, but the bases will need to be rewritten. So 4, I would rewrite it as 2 squared. And notice my parentheses. This is super, super important. And then 8 to the power of x minus 2, I'll rewrite that as 2 cubed to the power of x minus 2. Now that I have my bases the same, I can actually set my exponents equal. But remember what we talked about earlier. We have to 
multiply our uh, exponents first because we have a power to a power. So on the left side, it's going to be relatively easy. 2 times 4x is just 2 to the power of 8x. But on the right side, we need to distribute carefully. So I like to put parentheses. And now we're dealing with 2 to the power of 3x minus 6. Once we have our common base, check, we can now set the exponents equal. So on the left side, all I need to do is set 8x equal to 3x minus 6. I can ignore these bases. Okay, now we have to solve for x. So let's get x by itself. We'll isolate our variable on the left side. We'll get 5x equals negative 6. And then finishing off, I'll get x equals negative 6 over 5. And that's my final answer here. All right. Number 10. Select all that apply given this graph. Okay, so we're given this graph on the left, which is a downward shaping parabola. And let's go through these letters one by one. So letter A says that our positive interval lasts from negative 3 until positive 1. To be positive means that you're above the x-axis. So between negative 3 and positive 1, yeah, my graph is indeed above the x-axis that whole time. So that's going to be true. I'll circle, I'll circle letter A as yes, that is true. Okay, next. B says the axis of symmetry is y equal to 4. So first thing to know is that y equals 4 is a line that goes through the y-axis. So y equals 4 right here. And if it's a straight line that goes through that point, then that means it's a line that looks like this. Well, that's not our axis of symmetry. Our axis of symmetry is this line which goes through the x-axis at x equals negative 1. That's our real axis of symmetry. So I'm going to go ahead and mark B as false. Mm -hmm. okay, I'm trying to keep this clean, but I think instead I'm just kind of like, causing technical difficulties. All right, give me one second. Here we are. All right, so that's going to be incorrect. out of the picture, okay? We found out that our axis of symmetry is actually x equals negative 1. Next, the y-intercept is 0, 3. Well, 0, 3 is right over here, and that is indeed where we cross the y-axis. That's what it means to be the y-intercept. That's true. Next, the domain. That means all the x values that our graph covers is just from negative 3 to positive 1. That means our graph only exists between negative 3 and 1. That's absolutely not true. Our graph exists to the left of negative 3 because there, there it is. Right? At negative 4, for example, it has a negative value. I'm sure at negative 5, it's down here somewhere. So our graph does exist to the left. And not only that, it also exists over here to the right. 
because I have this arrow indicating that this is going forever. So my domain is actually negative infinity to positive infinity. And we're going to make sure that we mark that as false. Next, the range. Range represents all the y values that the graph covers. So let's see. To read the range, you go from bottom to top. So since our graph is going forever down, we know that we're covering from negative infinity. And it exists up until, that's the highest y value that we take, is positive 4. So our graph goes from negative infinity to positive 4. Notice that we have a bracket, meaning we're including positive 4. And that's because, yeah, our graph actually does take on that value. It has a vertex at negative 1, 4. So since it hits 4, we're going to include it. This is true. That is our range. Now finally, we need to talk about where is our graph decreasing. So let's see. To talk about increasing and decreasing, we read from left to right. Um, so let's see how our graph is behaving. Well, from the left, from negative, from x equals negative infinity, our graph is actually increasing, right? It's rising. But right here, it reaches a turning point. At x equals negative 1, it changes from increasing to now it's going downwards. So we can say that our graph is decreasing from our x value of negative 1 up until infinity. And that's exactly what it says in, in F, so we're going to circle that as true. So we're halfway now through our study guide. Let's pause there, and I'll continue in a separate video, part two.